All right, good to see you here tonight on July the 4th, and uh, I'm glad to see anybody here, to be honest with you. I didn't know what to expect. thought my wife and I might have a good service tonight, but uh, it's good to see you here. That's great, and uh, we're going to have a good service together. Thanks for coming. Go to Matthew 17. Matthew 17. We're going to continue our study of Peter. And I... Take your coat off. Once it's, once it's past 85, coats go, all right? That's, I don't know if it's in the Bible, but I'm going to find it someday, all right? Amen. All right, Matthew 17. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them, with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture here tonight. Lord, I'm praying that you will help us to concentrate for the next few minutes, that we can glean some truths here that you have for us from the life of Peter. Lord, thank you for this man, and thank you for his discipleship. Thank you, Lord, for his faith. Thank you, Lord, even for his failures, for it helps us. Lord, I'm, I know it must have been painful for him to see you record his failures, but it has been an encouragement to us. Because, Lord, as you forgave him and you picked him up time and time again and you used him, it gives us encouragement that you'll use us as well in spite of our failures. And so, Lord, open our understanding tonight. Holy Spirit, be our teacher, please. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're studying our... Uh, Peter, if you remember from last week, and, and I realize that you probably don't, but uh, I'll try to refresh your memory a little bit, all right? And uh, we were talking the other day, uh, where, where, where was I? I think um, I was reading on, uh, I mean, a, uh, a pastor was talking about he was going into Canada, I believe. And as he was crossing, the guard was looking at his paperwork, and he asked him what he did for a living. He said, I'm a pastor. And The guard said, is that right? He said, what did you preach on Sunday? And he he then, wow. He said he he couldn't think of anything right off the bat. And he uh, he said, but he remembered a sermon he had preached, and so he started preaching that one. And uh, then later on he said, I remembered why. He said, because I didn't preach Sunday morning. I had a guest preacher in. That's why I didn't remember what I preached. But... So I realized that oftentimes the preacher himself doesn't remember what he preached, and certainly that was last, that was so last Wednesday, you may not remember that. So uh, we talked about his confession of Christ last week, the great confession, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And remember Jesus looked at him and said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven, he's the one who revealed that to you. And Peter, you know, got Barney Fife about, yeah, that's me, buddy. God's speaking to me, you know. And it wasn't long after that when Jesus said, okay, now I'm going to suffer and die. Then Peter took him and thought he could rebuke the Lord. Boy, talk about going from complimented to rebuked. In fact, complimented that God revealed something to him to Jesus saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Wow. That's sure from up here to down there pretty fast, wasn't it? And that's his, what was he doing? When he, when he doesn't want Christ to suffer and die, he's canceling the cross. Saying, no, the cross can't be part of the plan. That can't be uh, part of God's will. And so he went from the confession of Christ that he's the Son of the living God to 
canceling the cross. He rebukes Jesus when he tells him that he's going to suffer and die. Now we're going to come to some more comments Peter made. Peter was always making comments. And uh, we, we could go on for weeks on this, but I've, I'm trying to get all the disciples in and uh, do that uh, hopefully this summer before we get to the fall, but we'll see if we'll get there or not. So we won't co cover all of them, but the next one I want to talk about is this one we read tonight in Matthew 17. And that is when it comes to constructing tabernacles. Constructing tabernacles. As you read, they go up to the Mount uh, of Transfiguration, as it's called, because Jesus was transfigured there. And three disciples go up, Peter, James, and John, the three that were always closest to Jesus, and as they go up, they, they watch Jesus um, transfigured. I mean, he began to glow. I mean, he became white and glistening, and, and, and he was transformed. I, thought, I think they saw the glorified Christ. I really do. And there he was, and then two other people appear to talk with him. And we know from the passage it was Moses and Elijah. And so uh, the first guy to speak up of course, is Peter. And the words just kind of roll right out. Hey, he said, Lord, I got an idea. First of all, it's really interesting. And did you notice what he said in verse number four? Lord, it's good for us to be here. Boy, that's the understatement of the year, isn't it? I'm on the Mount of Transfiguration. I see the glorified Christ. I see Moses and Elijah. And I'm going to make the great statement. I think it's good to be here. And it is. Uh, Jesus told me to come here, so it's got to be good. And then he said, If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. Three tents, if you will. That's all a tabernacle was, was a tent. And he says, I want to make three of these, and, and uh, one for each one of you. And, and he had hardly got the words out of his mouth, and another voice was heard. And it wasn't James, and it wasn't John. And it wasn't a Moses or Elijah. It was a voice from heaven. It was God's voice. Yeah, that's the next voice they heard. And you know what he said? The voice of God. While he had spake, a bright cloud overshadowed them. A voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Now when the disciples heard that voice, verse 6, they fell on their face and were afraid. They, they went face down right now. They knew who was speaking. And that voice thundered out of the cloud. And, and so they knew that that was the voice of God. And that quieted things down right now. Now, I want to, what was this all about? What, why did the Lord take them to the Mount of Transfiguration? All right? I think two reasons. Number one, Jesus was teaching these disciples, these three, about who he was. I think he was confirming Peter's confession that he is the Christ the Son of the living God. That He really is the Son of God. They saw Him in His glorified form. And then uh, he, he, saw, huh, he saw Him speaking with Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament. And, and, about, and by the way, they're talking, the Bible says, in Luke, He said they talked about His coming death. And remember when Jesus walked on the road to Emmaus and He uh, he. he opened the Scriptures to the men who he's walking with, and he, he, he showed them, it says, in the law and the prophets and the Psalms, the things concerning himself. So Moses, he told the Pharisees one day, if you don't believe Moses, you believe me because Moses wrote about me. So we know Moses wrote about Christ. We know the prophets wrote about Christ, and that's who's here, Moses and Elijah representing the prophets. And so we know that they, they so now they're discussing the death of Christ and His Him coming up crucifixion in Jerusalem. In fact, Jesus at the end of the situation, at the end of this event here on the mountain, tells the disciples, you can't tell anybody about this till after I'm risen from the dead. Well, that, that wouldn't have been easy to do either. <laughs> you just saw this spectacular event and you saw Moses and Elijah and you saw the glorified Christ and now you can't tell anybody what you saw until after Jesus has risen from the dead. All right? So, I think he was, it was about Christ's identity and Christ's mission. Who he was and what he was sent here to do. Secondly, 
the Mount of Transfiguration was Jesus wanting His disciples to know that He would be glorified. That He would be glorified. But not the way they were thinking. Not in the manner they thought He would be. It's not going to be because of worldly honor. It's not going to be because He's going to uh, you know, have war with the Romans and take them down so the Jews can be back and get out from underneath the, the authority of Rome. So that's, that's not the way I'm going to be glorified. It's going to be through death and resurrection that I'll be glorified. And they had to understand that. They had to get a, get a grasp of that. All right. Now, let's talk about Peter's comment that he made about building three tabernacles, three tents to, to build in. There's, there's a couple things I want you to notice about this. Uh, number one, it was disrespectful. So what do you mean? It was disrespectful to Jesus. Building three tabernacles would put Moses, Elijah, and Jesus all on equal footing. And, and they're not on equal footing. Moses, great man. Elijah, great man. But they are not even close to Jesus. Jesus compares to no man. There's, there's no one like Jesus Christ. Uh, there's no one to be compared to Him. No one is on His level. And Christ is never on any man's level. No, no man is ever on Christ's level, and Christ is never on any man's level. He's on a level all of His own. And He only... That's why, that's, why G, that's why God spoke from heaven and said, This is My beloved Son. Hear ye Him. And when they got up off their face, who was there? Nobody but Jesus. <laughs> Moses and Elijah, whoosh, they were gone. Okay? And, and because Jesus is the one. All right, and and so it was disrespectful to the Lord. But secondly, it had a disregard for God's will. It had a disregard for God's will because building a tabernacle for them there, building a tent for them there, would have kept them all from God's will. It would have kept Moses and Elijah from a better place where they were, but it would have kept Jesus from the appointed work that He came to do. It wasn't time yet for Him to have a tabernacle and for people to come and, and to worship Him. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to die on the cross for the sins of mankind. Now, there's something I do want you to see while I'm here uh, that I think is important. I want you to go back to Second Peter, one of the epistles that Peter wrote. It's in the back of your New Testament. If you turn to your right there, go... go uh, Go past Hebrews, you get Hebrews, after Hebrews is James, and right after James you find 1 Peter. Go to 2 Peter, the second epistle of Peter. Peter, in writing here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he gets to write about this experience that he had on the Mount of Transfiguration. All right? Notice what he said, verse 16 of 2 Peter chapter 1. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Well, when did Peter, when was he an eyewitness of the majesty of Jesus Christ? Had to be on the Mount of Transfiguration. Well, what did he say? For he, that's Jesus, received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, when did you hear that voice, Peter? Well, he said, this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So he said, I, I want you to know I heard the audible voice of God. Hey, that's pretty cool. I, I've... I've I, I've not heard the audible voice of God. Okay? I haven't heard that. Some people say they have. Uh, one guy heard it and built a 900-foot prayer tower. At least he said he did. He said he heard the voice. But what did Peter say? Look at the next verse. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. More, more sure than what? More sure than the audible voice of God? Well, what can be more sure than the audible voice of God? Well, let's see. 
Where until you do well that you take heed is unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the what church? Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. When he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, what's he referring to? He's referring to God's written word. He's saying, he's saying here that you can mistake a voice, but you won't mistake his word. And if you have a choice between hearing the audible voice of God or having his written word, you better take the written word. Guys, if, if, if any man, if you're in business of any kind and, a, and you say, well, uh, uh, let's, let's write this down and let's have it in writing. And the fellow says, no, I think our word will be good enough. That may make you a little shaky. Because when, when you just have somebody's word on it, they can go back on their word. They can say, no, I didn't say that. No, I said this. And you can say, no, you didn't. You said that and all you got is argument. And the truth is, sometimes... You can hear a voice and you don't know whose voice it is. That voice you think you heard may have been because you had too many anchovies and something on your pizza that night and you were hearing voices. But it wasn't necessarily the voice of God. But you will not mistake the written Word of God. Okay? Don't, don't mistake that, alright? Now, let's go to the next point here. We want to talk about the next time we have a comment from Peter is his denials of Jesus. For that, go to Luke 22, would you please? Luke chapter 22, his denials of Jesus. It's pretty well known and well documented. All four Gospels uh, record these for us. In Luke 22, <clears throat> we begin in verse 31 where the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Remember last week we talked about uh, what was Peter's given name? His Simon, Simon. What did the Lord call him? The Lord gave him another name. Peter. Uh, stone, right? Piece of the rock, all right? And, and usually every time that he did something pretty good, he would call him Peter. Whenever he addresses him as Simon, this isn't a good thing coming, all right? So here he is. Simon, Simon, twice. Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before thou, thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And so we see the... the denial that begins to come. And this is the warning that God gave about the denial. Now, I want you to skip down to where uh, we, we get the rest of the story, so to speak. And um, beginning at, uh, hold on just a second here. My, the one bad thing about putting your notes on an iPad is when it shuts off. I got it, I got it now, all right? If you will, skip down to verse 54. The Bible says, And they took him, and led him, and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter did what, church? Ooh, that doesn't sound good to me. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire, and earnestly looked upon him, and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou also art of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another, confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. I want you to see, the first of all, the warning in his denial. Jesus had warned him about it, didn't he? He had told him before the cock crow, You're going to deny me three times. But you know what? Just as the Lord warned Peter, 
doesn't the Lord warn us? Oh, it may not be His voice, but it'll be a scripture, or it'll be a sermon, or it could be the word of a friend. Somebody's saying something to us that's a warning, and it all depends whether we'll heed the warning or not. Or whether we'll be proud like Peter. You know what Peter did to the warning Jesus gave him? That's Greek for... Okay? He says, you know what? I, not me. Other people made it. Not me. I'm ready to go to prison and I'll die for you. Wow, that's pretty proud. How'd that work out for him? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Don't, don't, don't ever look at anyone else and anything they've said or done and say, boy, I'd never do that. You ought to say, by the grace of God, I'll never do that. Because anything that anyone does, we are capable of doing that as well. That, that sin is in us too. And so, don't, take the warnings that, that God gives us. One thing's for certain, you can never blame God for your failures. Because He warns you. He warns us about sin. He warns us about the deception of sin. He warns us and gives us gives us boundaries to stay in, but sometimes we just don't care. In our pride, we're going to go on anyway. I'll be the exception. I won't be the rule. And just as Peter found out, we're not the exception. That was a warning. Now look at the wickedness in the denials. And I say wickedness because Peter flat out lied. Four times. Four lies Peter told in the denials. Number one, he denied being with Christ. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read these for you. In Matthew 26, in verses 69 and 70, here's what the Bible says. This is a Matthew's account of the same situation here, all right? Now Peter sat without in the palace. A damsel said unto him, saying, came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. I don't know. I wasn't with him. Completely denied being with Christ. Secondly, he denied being one of Christ's disciples. He denied being one of his disciples. In John 18 and verse 17, the damsels that kept the door said unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? And he saith, I am not. No, I'm not one of his disciples. Again, in verse number 25, Simon Peter stood and warned himself, and they said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? And he denied it and said, I am not. Wow. So he denied being with Christ. He denied being one of Christ's disciples. He denied knowing Christ. Matthew 26, verse number 72 and again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Verse 74, Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. He denied even knowing Christ. Third lie. Fourth lie. He denied even understanding the accusations. Mark words it this way in, in Mark chapter 14. Mark 14 and verse number 68. But he denied saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. I don't even understand what you're talking about. He made like he didn't even understand where in the world they're coming from. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God, had, Jesus is always best defended with the truth. Truth. Those who stand for Christ have to stand for the truth. Always. If you don't, you're a mighty poor testimony for Jesus Christ. There's no such thing as a white lie. 
are a little lie. A lie is a lie. Don't start down that road. Be truthful. Jesus is the truth. He lied. He dishonored Christ. On more than one occasion, this is the guy who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When, when they went away from Him in John 6, Peter said, and Jesus said, Will you also go away? Peter said, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Boy, He knew who Jesus was. And if that, listen, if this can happen to Peter, it could happen to you or me. Don't, don't be too hard on Peter. That can happen to us. And so we have to beware and be careful. And by the way, it all started when we read earlier, Peter followed afar off. You see, when you are just concerned that, you, you, know, where, where the, you know where the far off comes from? When people say, well, I'm saved, that's all that matters. And you're really not interested in seeing how close to Christ you can be. You're just willing to follow afar off. That's a dangerous place to be. That's, that's not the crowd you want to be in. You see, I'll reiterate, when, when every time that Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, you know who he was with? He was with other disciples. But here, he's, when he denies the Lord, there's no disciples around. He's only with the enemies of Christ. He's around the people that will shout, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! That's who He's around. And He crumbled. He crumbled. So, listen, that's why, that's why when the preacher says, and man, I'll be honest with you, 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 you've amazed me tonight by coming to church on July 4th. I'm really, really, we've got a decent crowd. I'm, 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 I'm stunned. And, and, and thank you. I, I'm, I appreciate you coming. But you understand, that's, that's good because you're saying, I don't want to follow afar off. I want to be close. And the way you be close is you stay with the people of God. And when they gather, you want to be here. Because I don't want to... It, you know the devil who, the, who he begins to look for? The wolf begins to look for the sheep that lags behind and doesn't stay with the flock. So, so stay up. Use some awful defiling words. You begin to curse and swear. That's why, that's why cursing and swearing never becomes a Christian. When he wanted them to know, I'm not a follower of his. I don't know him. I don't hang around him. I don't know what you're talking about. How was he going to communicate that to them? He started to curse and swear. There's no place for cursing and swearing in the life of a Christian. People are always in trouble when they have to resort to profanity to enforce what they're saying. You mark this down. Profanity is the strongest expression of a weak mind. It shows how shallow of a vocabulary you have that you have to resort to profanity. It shows just how weak-minded you really are. The last thing I want you to see in about the denials is the weeping in the denials. We know, we read in Luke 22 and verse number 62 that he went out and wept bitterly. I probably don't have to tell you this. Most of you, if you've been saved any length of time, you've experienced this, that sin is a great prompter of tears. Tears tell us what a great deceiver sin is. How, how deceptive our own heart can be. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And Peter's own heart deceived him. And sin never delivers what it promises. 
It only gives you trouble and sorrow. Always. Always. It ends up in bitter tears for Peter. Well, it didn't look good. But let's go now to John 21, all right? And let's talk lastly about his reinstatement. I, I could talk about the resurrection and some things that, that were said there. And um, there were... There were several times when, when Jesus arose from the dead, from the time Jesus arose from the dead until He ascended back to heaven was 40 days. Over that 40-day period, He appeared several times to His disciples. All right? What you're going to read here in John 21 is, is between His second and third appearances. So He's appeared to Him in the upper room. He's appeared to Him probably, I think, the second time would have been the next Lord's Day when Thomas showed up because Thomas missed Sunday night church the first Sunday Jesus showed up. Okay? The, the golf tournament ran over and he was watching it. So he didn't get to church in time. But Jesus now is... So it's between the second and third time. And here's what's happening. After these things, verse 1, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they said unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and into a ship immediately, into a ship immediately and that night they caught what? Nothing. When the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus said to them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Now then, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So he's appearing to his disciples, and Peter, you want to understand something, Peter says, I, I'm going fishing. And uh, most of you know, we have, and in English I know there's other tenses, but the main tenses we have are past, present, and future. I know there's some other things there, English teachers, but we're not concerned with those right now. But those are the main ones. But in the, in the language the Bible is written in, there's a continual tense that we don't have in English. When Peter here says, I go a fishing, it means I'm going to go fishing and go fishing and keep on going fishing. What was Peter before he became a disciple? A fisherman. You know what Peter was saying? I'm done. I'm going back to fishing. I'm going to go back to what I was doing before. I failed at this business. How would you feel if you just went through what Peter went through? You cursed and denied you even knew the Lord. You would feel like you were washed up too. And as far as we know, in the first two appearances in the upper room, no special conversations with Peter. Thomas, reach hither your hands and touch me. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. We don't know what else went on in the upper room, but apparently, at least in Scripture, nothing said to Peter. And so Peter says, well, I think I'm done. And the tragic thing is, as he goes back and wants to just go back to fishing, he takes a bunch of guys with him. You, you never, listen, you'll never backslide, but you'll affect other people. You always will. 
And, and so don't think, well, what I do is my business. No, it, it's other people's business too because you will affect other people. When Jonah backslid and ran away from God, do you think it mattered to those sailors in the boat where he got in? When the storm came up and they were fighting for their lives? Yeah, I think it mattered to them that this guy wasn't right with God. It affected their life. And, and when you backslide, hey, teenager, if you backslide and you go away from God, it'll affect your house. It'll affect the people who live in your house. If you backslide and you're running from God, it could affect where you work. Here, the fellows followed him. Well, they fished all night and didn't catch anything. Jesus stands on the shore and he says, Hey, you got any fish? There's only one thing worse than fishing and not catching anything, and that is somebody asking you if you've caught anything. Huh? No. And he says, well, try your net on the right side. Hey, had they ever heard that before? Remember the very first time when Jesus came and He asked to borrow the boat and they pushed out from shore and He talked to people on the land and when He was done, He said, now go out and cast your net down. And Peter said, come on, Lord, we went all night and didn't catch anything. It ain't biting, it ain't biting. And besides, you're a carpenter, I'm a fisherman, I know my business. And yet, he said, I'll let down a net. Remember that? Singular. And they went out and let down the net, and there were so many fish, the net broke. They had to call the other boat and get the boat in and haul them to shore. Remember what Peter did that day? Fell down at Jesus' feet and said, I'm a sinful man, depart from me. Hmm? So I think when he said, throw your net on the right side, and they did, and a great multitude of fish jumped in. I think he said, wait a minute. <laughs> and it wasn't Peter first. It was, I think, John who said to him, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. And of course, they jump in the water. They come to the shore. And Jesus has a fire burning. He's already cooking some fish. He says, now you bring in what you got too, and we'll add to what I've got here. I think it was pretty quiet there on shore. But I don't, what I don't want you to miss is it was uh, when, let me see if I see it. Yeah, here, verse number 9. As, they were come, as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of what? Coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. Do you know what kind of fire it was that Peter was warming his hands at that night when he denied the Lord? It was a fire of coals. Do you think, do smells ever remind you of memories? Hmm? You ever smell something and say, oh, that reminds me of grandma's cookies or grandma's, how come I always think of food memories? I don't know what that is. What is up with that? But, and uh, there's, there's memories associated with the smell. Do you think as he smells that charcoal fire, it reminded Peter of anything? It's interesting, he made a fire of coals to cook that fish on. And Jesus breaks the silence Verse 15, when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Three times. I don't think that ought to be lost on us either. He smells the fire, it reminds him of denying Christ three times. And three times Jesus asked him, Lovest thou me? Now, I'll just pause here to say something and you can, I'll, I'll, I can show you later if you want me to. But there's, there's teaching here about the different Greek words that are used for love. But the truth is that it doesn't really hold up through the New Testament. Phileo and agape and all that. There are times when Jesus says, The Father loveth the Son. Well, what word would you think that would be? Agape. comes from God. But it isn't. It's phileo. It's just not 
consistent through the New Testament. There are times you think for sure it came from God. It has to be agape love, but it is the word used is phileo at times. So it doesn't hold up. I think to look at it, I think it's the three times of repetition, the same as the three denials, the same kind of fire, the same kind of smell. And I think Peter is grieved. He knows. And he's questioning whether I love him. And isn't that what it always comes down to? Do you love me? Isn't, isn't that why we're supposed to do what we do? Because we love Jesus Christ? Isn't our motivation supposed to be love? 1 Corinthians 13 about charity. Uh, though if, I, if I give all my goods to the poor and I give my body to be burned and I do all this and I don't have charity, it profits me not worth anything. If I'm not at church tonight because I love Jesus, it profits me nothing. Won't mean it. It'll burn up. When the fire's set to it at judgment, it'll burn up. If I don't go out and witness because I love Jesus, it won't mean anything. It'll burn up. Wood, hay, and stubble. That's why Paul wrote, it's the love of Christ that constrains me. I do it because I love Jesus Christ. What's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your, everything you have. You do it because you love Him. Now, Peter <clears throat> got concerned. Jesus prophesies here, by the way, in verse 18, and we'll say something about this in a minute, and we'll be done. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, what two words? Follow me. Follow me. And amazingly enough, Peter turned about. And see it, the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? That was what the one who leaned on his breast asked at the Last Supper. Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? <laughs> Didn't Jesus just say, follow me? What's he looking at John for? He just, he just made it pretty clear you're not following John, you're following me. And Peter, that quick, got his eyes off Christ. And of course, again, here's a rebuke. Uh, Jesus said to him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So, it's easy to get our eyes off Christ and start looking at other people. But if we're going to follow Jesus Christ, we must keep our eyes on Him and not others. We must follow Christ and not others. You can't follow Christ and keep your eyes on people. You're going to get discouraged. You're going to get off track. Peter took that commission very, very seriously. You know that and, and we could take time, like I say, we could go weeks and we could go into Acts and, and the upper room and Pentecost and, and all the way through the early church in Jerusalem into Acts chapter 10 and Cornelius. We could follow Peter all the way through there. But Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2 wrote this, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Feed the flock of God. Where did he get those words? <laughs> he got those words from Jesus himself. And he knew that he was to feed the sheep. Peter's the main character as he leads the, the early church in, the, in Jerusalem. Throughout the book of Acts, he takes the gospel to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 as the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Two books Peter penned, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. It's interesting that 1 Peter... The whole theme of the book of 1 Peter is the sufferings. Suffering for Jesus. 
It was written in 63 AD, which is under the reign of the Emperor Nero, who burned Christians alive. Parties would be held, and, and much like you have those poles, you know, with the little, what do they call those things with the flame on top? What? You're talking in, talking in tongues here. Tiki? Tiki torches? I, wow, those poles are... Only he would impale Christians on them, douse them with fluid, and light them on fire. Nero was, was a great persecutor of Christians. And so Peter writes to these Christians about suffering as a Christian. Suffering. The man who wanted to rebuke Jesus because the plan of God involves suffering is used by the Holy Spirit to write a book about suffering. 1 Peter. Paul was beheaded by Nero in AD 64. The New Testament is pretty silent on Peter after the book of Acts. It's, Paul mentions him in Galatians, but I do want to say this. There's no mention in the Bible, or no mention in all of history, about, about Peter ever being in Rome the Catholic Church likes to teach Peter was the first pope. But there's no record of him ever being in Rome. Ever being in Italy. Paul, in fact, Paul in the last chapter to the book of Rome, to, to, the, to the Romans that he wrote an epistle to, in the last chapter he mentions 27 different names of saints in Rome. And Peter isn't one of them. I imagine if he'd have been close or around there, he would have at least got a mention by the Apostle Paul but never mentioned there. The Bible doesn't record how Peter died. It's generally believed because of Jesus' prophecy that he was crucified upside down at his own request. Feeling unworthy to be crucified in the same way that the Lord Jesus was crucified. Apostle Peter. What a, what a man. A great man. Great faith. Great leader. Human. Yeah, very much so. But greatly used by God. Reinstated here in John 21. You say, well, I don't, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. Hey, I'm not sure that any of us would rise to the point where we curse and swore and deny we even knew who Jesus was. But Jesus, and you know what's amazing? Jesus never brought it up. I mean, if that's you and me, and the first time you see Peter after he did that, if, if it was you or me, what would you say? Wouldn't you say, what were you thinking? What, what were you doing, man? We'd, uh, we'd, had some an we'd want some answers. Jesus never mentioned it. Just said, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than the fishing business? Do you love me more than these, maybe the other disciples? Do you love me before anything else? And Peter proved that was true. Great man. And worthy of your study. If you ever want to do a study, just study Peter. And we've got to move on. We've got to get some of the other disciples. But he's certainly a worthy example for us to follow. The only other, the only other guy in the world that walked on water beside Jesus is Peter. Pretty good guy. Pretty good guy. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, thank you for the life of Peter. Thank you, Father, for including it all for us in the Bible. He's a man of great faith and he's a man of great obedience. He listened to you when you told him to call nothing unclean that you've called clean. And he took the gospel to Cornelius. And the, 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 the Gentiles began to hear about Jesus. Thank you for his faithfulness. Thank you for the epistles that you used him to pen, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. They've helped us. We've been encouraged by them. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be mindful that we're to follow you. I pray that no one here tonight would, maybe if someone's been looking at others and beginning to get discouraged, they'd get their eyes back on you. And they would simply follow you. We'd hear you say to each of us, follow me. Anytime we get to thinking about, well, what about so-and-so? What about, remind us to follow 
you. Help us to take heed any time we think we, can, we are standing to know that we could fall. We need your grace. We need your help each and every day. Now, Father, we pray you'll dismiss us with your care. Be with us as we go our separate ways and some will be going out to get-togethers and for fireworks. And, Lord, again, we pray for safety for everyone involved. Make us mindful that you go with us everywhere we go. May others see Christ in us this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.